Our next speaker is one of the true pioneers of non-invasive prenatal testing. Dennis Lowe is the director of the Li Ka Shing Institute of Health Sciences at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And among his many uh, uh, prestigious uh, awards and accomplishments, he is the winner of the inaugural Future Science Prize in Life Science, which is China's uh, equivalent of the Nobel Prize, a newly introduced uh, prize, sort of modeled also on the, on the Breakthrough Prize. So it's fantastic that we have Dennis uh, Lowe here. Please welcome Dennis Lowe. Thank you. So good morning. It's my honor and privilege to be invited by Larry to this very exciting and unique meeting. So today I'd like to share with you some of our work on the development of cell-free DNA tests. So this picture is actually myself uh, over four years ago when I was still a medical student at Oxford. So as we know, as a medical student, we have to actually study different subjects. And one of the subjects that I studied was obstetrics. And I learned about the practice of prenatal testing, which at that time was actually dominated by invasive techniques like amniocentesis. And I learned that every time we stick a needle into a uterus, there's some 0.5% chance that we might actually kill the baby. And so as a young man, I was wondering, why did doctors do dangerous things like that? Can we not just take a blood sample from a mother and be able to tell something about a baby? But of course, at that time, the main school of thought is that the circulation system of the mother and baby are separate. So theoretically, you couldn't redo really that. But then I was thinking that maybe actually that barrier is not completely tight. So maybe there's some trafficking between that placenta barrier. So I was thinking, well, can we develop some method to detect the baby's cells in the mother's blood? But of course the question, you need to have some sort of marker. So I thought that maybe one simple way is if a baby is a boy, then maybe we can actually suddenly see male cells in the blood of the mother. And I actually remember I was talking to some professor at that time to ask them to give me a chance to do it. But of course, some of them think that, you know, this won't work. If it worked, then people have done it many years ago. But eventually, actually, one professor said, okay, I'll let you to do this in my lab for a few months. And so we did a variety of methods, and one of which is very simple. Just have a dye which will stain the male chromosome. And then here you can see that basically there are a number of cells which are male cells in the blood of a pregnant woman. And you can also use DNA amplification technique using this polymerase chain reaction PCR, which was actually just being developed at that time. So actually our group was very lucky that we were actually one of the first group outside of Kerry Muller's group to actually do this. So in, in, in the end, we're actually able to publish this paper in The Lancet just in a year when I qualified, in which we actually use a Y chromosome marker, which is repeated up to 5,000 times per male cells. And then a few months later, Lancet actually published an editorial called, Is It a Boy? Because you can theoretically use this technology to diagnose the sex of a baby. And then I qualify, and then I work as a junior doctor for one year. But during that year, I constantly think about this field, because I thought that I did some experiments. I'd like to finish it. So after the one year, I decided to put the medical training on hold and then went back to Oxford and do this full-time. Now, this is a picture of myself as a full-time PhD student. So you can see that I'm sort of uh, dressed up a little bit like a terrorist. <laughs> and, and the reason is because I use a Y chromosome, a male chromosome, as a marker. And of course, every cell in my body has that male chromosome. So I'm trying to protect my samples from myself. But the problem is that once I start to work on that full time, I realize it's very challenging. Because whereas it's quite easy to detect something which is repeated 5,000 times per male cell, when you try to do that for a single copy gene, it just won't work reliably. So for the next three and a half years, I keep on trying, but couldn't get to work. And eventually, actually, my fellowship uh, finished, so I have to to, to get my degree. So at that time, the science didn't go too well, but at least I actually knew my wife, who's actually in the audience today, so Alice. And so the two of us actually uh, graduated together, actually in 94. And after that, I went back into clinical practice and did that for the next few years, until 97. So 97 was the year when actually Hong Kong went back to China. And so many people in Hong Kong were very worried, and so suddenly there are many jobs available. So, so Alice and I, because we have elderly parents in Hong Kong, so we decided to go back at that juncture. And then I joined the Chinese University of Hong Kong, 
which is in the northeastern part of Hong Kong with a very nice campus. And at that time, then I have a chance to start to think, what have I done wrong for the previous eight years? Why in one work? And then interestingly, about three months before I left from UK back to Hong Kong, in this issue of Nature Medicine, there are two papers, which says that cancer cell will release its DNA into a plasma and serum of cancer patients. And then suddenly I have a strange thought, because I thought that the baby growing inside mother is actually a little bit like a cancer growing in a patient. And also in my clinical experience, I've yet to see a cancer which is as big as an eight pound baby, right? So I thought if a smallish cancer can release enough DNA for us to see in the blood, then surely a baby can do that, at least in the later stage of pregnancy. So in other words, what it means is actually for the previous eight years, I was looking in the wrong place. I was trying to look for the fetal cells when what I should be looking at is in this fluid part of blood called plasma. But then the problem at that time is because I just resigned from Oxford, I didn't have a grant, and so how can I do that, right? I can only do something very cheap, and I've never handled plasma before. But then I remember when I was a medical student in Oxford, when I had enough of the college food, I actually sometimes go back to my room and cook instant noodles. And then of course what you do is that you just boil some water, right, and then, you put the noodles in, and then five minutes later, out come your dinner. So I was thinking, how about if I would boil some of that plasma serum and then take a few drops of that juice to be tested? And you probably think it's crazy, but if you don't have money, this is what you have to do, right? <laughs> now, strangely, when I do that, I actually find that this juice is able to give me some signal in some women and no signals in others. And then later on, I find all those women with the signal from Y chromosome all have baby boys, and all those without signal all have baby girls. I just could not believe this, actually, when I first saw this result. Then I realized the mistake I've been making. For the previous eight years, I've been throwing away the plasma, which is the good stuff. And now we know, actually, this fetal DNA is present in plasma very early on, like from the seven weeks of pregnancy onwards. And actually, by the 10 weeks, it reaches 15% which is amazingly high because the baby is tiny at that point and the mother is so huge. And also, after the delivery, this field DNA is gone within two hours. So the kinetics is very fast. And then we thought, that, well, maybe I can use this now to do some prenatal testing. And we start with simple things first. The first thing we do is to tell the sex of the baby, which can be useful because some genetic disease predominantly affect boys because that, those mutant genes are present on X chromosome, and a boy only have one copy of the X chromosome, a hemophilia or some forms of muscle dystrophy. And then we also try to see if we can tell the blood group type of the baby, which can be useful, because sometimes when a mother and baby have different blood group type, the, the mother will produce antibodies who will attack the baby. And then subsequently, we find that the sexing and the blood group typing are very accurate over 99% accurate. So those are now in routine use in many parts of the world. And then we become more ambitious. So the number one reason why pregnant women want to do prenatal testing is because they are worried that baby might have chromosome disorders like Down syndrome. So we wonder, can we use this for Down syndrome testing? So Down syndrome is when we have an extra copy of chromosome 21. But this is quite tough because you not diagnose chromosome abnormalities when you look at a cell and ask how many chromosomes it has got inside a cell. But in this technology, we don't have cells. We only have DNA floating outside cells. So we have actually been working on this for about 10 years. And initially, we're thinking, well, can we somehow enrich for fetal DNA that work a little bit, but doesn't work very well? So eventually, back in 2007, we decided to go back to a drawing board and then think, is there any way you can do that without actually you know, enriching a field DNA? So we're thinking the problem at that time is that you have this field DNA molecules in, uh, in yellow being surrounded by a lot of mother's DNA molecules. And this background from the mother will interfere with your analysis. So we're thinking how about if I don't do this analysis on block? If I pass this sample into many, many tubes, so at each tube, we have only one copy of the DNA target, and sometimes no target. So in this juncture, this field DNA can be analyzed on its own without interference by the mother. So this approach is single molecule testing, and some people call it digital testing, because it's like your digital computer, one and zero. 
And initially, when we do that, we find that it works. We can tell if a baby has Down syndrome. So we published that in 2007. But strangely, a few weeks after this publication, I saw another paper with almost exactly the same idea. And strangely, the two papers were submitted on the same day. <laughs> so they're competition, OK? So then we decided, well, we have to work very hard and quick. But one problem with this digital analysis is that we're targeting one gene on chromosome 21. And you're wasting a lot of information because there are many genes on chromosome 21. So we're thinking, is there any way we can more efficiently utilize the sample? So we're thinking, how about if I sequence those DNA molecules in plasma, see millions of them? And because I know the human genome sequence, I can map each of those molecules back to the chromosome from which it comes from. And then I can plot the ratio of different chromosomes in plasma. And interesting, when I did that, I find that it can differentiate Down's from non-Down's pregnancy very well. Now, for example, look at chromosome 21. The Down syndrome pregnancy are in green and in red, and the signal is really high. The normal pregnancy is in blue and orange. The signal is very low. In this initial trial, we have 28 cases, 14 have Down syndrome and 14 control, 100% accuracy. So we published that in the year later. But strangely, within a few weeks of this paper, there's also another paper, <laughs> and this time in the same journal. And then I start to wonder, who is this guy, Stephen Quick? <laughs> so I look him up in the internet, and I realize he's from Stanford, and he's a professor of bioengineering. But interestingly, he also actually have a degree from Oxford. And strangely, also in the same year that we call it, I qualify. So I went home and spoke to my wife, and my wife said, well, why don't we take out this photo, right? <laughs> and we're there, and strangely, Steve Quick is there. <laughs> so it seems somehow, you know, the life is, of fate is bringing us together. And then strangely, in 2013, I was very fortunate to be elected into the National Academy of Science. And, and I saw my name on the list, of course, very happy. But then after that, a few <laughs> names are, is Steve Quick. So this was in the induction ceremony where we decided to take the pictures together. But anyway, back to work. Now, so, so now we have this prototype system, which seems to work, okay? So we want to push it out. And so we need to do a clinical trial. So for the next three years, then we work very hard on a clinical trial. And the result was surprisingly good. We actually find that we have over 99% accuracy in detecting Down syndrome by using this method. So the question now, I was in the university, and I can't push this out without the help of a company. And of course, with, if you want help from a company, you need to have patents, which I'm not experienced with. So we actually filed a few patents. And initially, the university actually licensed it to a UK-based company. But this company actually didn't realize the significance of this work. And they actually thought it was rubbish. So three years later, they give it back to the university, said, I don't want it. You, you can't have it back, OK? And then, so we were very disappointed. So I went uh, on various uh, conferences. And one of those conferences, I met Charles Cantor. It was actually in Pattaya, when Charles was actually talking about the mass spectrometry method. And thought, wow, that is a very precise method that can help us to measure this fetal DNA. And I invited him to come to my talk, which he graciously do. And so we start to talk and start to work together. And eventually, the technology was licensed to Sequinon, which was Charles' company. But of course, on the other side, <laughs> the, the people in Stanford are very expert in commercialization. So Steve Quick actually licensed his technology to Vernata, which was then acquired by Illumina. And then Sequinom and Illumina had a series of lawsuits. And actually, there was a four lawsuit which were particularly significant. And we won three of them, and they won one. So eventually, the two sides settled. And so we decided to pull all of our patents into a patent pool. So people just subscribe to it and gain access to the technology. But anyway, to cut a long story short, the technology was actually launched in the autumn of 2011. So we're now talking about eight years into this technology which now people call NIPT, non-invasive prenatal testing. So now every year, it's probably six or seven million tests are done every year. And actually, many people regard this as the most rapidly adopted genomic test ever. Now, of course, back in Hong Kong, so I'm very worried that 
Uh, currently, an IPT is still in the private market. People have to pay like 700 US dollars to access it. But some people in Hong Kong might not be very well off. So we actually decide to actually license it free of charge to the hospital authority in Hong Kong, which is our version of national health service. So actually, the NHS, or the health authority in Hong Kong, will provide this test free of charge from this summer onwards. And they'll launch it from this very nice hospital. This is the Hong Kong Children's Hospital overlooking the Victoria Harbor. OK, it seems that the goal, which I originally set out to do when I was a medical student, has largely been done, right? But of course, I'm still not quite ready to retire just yet, especially when I come to a conference like this and see many of you are so active you know, in your long career. So I was thinking, well, what else can I do? OK, so if you want to push this to the limit, then you would say, well, can I sequence the whole genome of a baby using this method? And this is a tough nut to crack, because the genome is like three billion base pair, right? And it's fragmented into many pieces. And the baby's genome and mother's genome are very similar and mixed together. So initially, I have no idea how do you do this. And then we think about this. But one day, I actually went to see this movie with my wife, <laughs> which is in 3D. So I remember I was in the cinema and put on my 3D glasses and waiting for a movie to start. And then I saw the Harry Potter sign flying out towards me in 3D. And my eyes was caught in this itch there, which actually at that time looked like a pair of chromosomes to me. <laughs> and then actually I actually realized every pair of chromosome the baby has got, it has one copy from father and one copy from mother. And then I told my wife, I said, I, I know how can we do it now? And then spent the next two hours thinking about that. <laughs> but it's what I realized is this. Let's say that this picture is the father's genome, and this picture is the mother's genome. So a baby will have one half from father and the other half from mother. So in the mother's blood, there's a lot of mother's genome floating around. And you're trying to decipher the fetal genome. OK, so remember, there are two algorithms, one for the father's side and one for the mother's side. So for the father's side first, what we do is that we look at the father's genome and look at the mother's genome. And try to find things which is only present in the father's side, but absent in the mother's side, but which is easier to find, like the flower. And then we go into the mother's blood, and then we hunt for the flower. So every time we find a flower, there's a little bit of fetal genome that has inherited from its father. And we sip all those flowers together, that out come the father's half of the baby's genome. Now, how about mother's side? Mother's side is more difficult, because the baby's DNA is swimming in this ocean of mother's DNA. So any flower that the mother gives the baby, the mother will have it herself. So you cannot use that method. So you have to do something cleverer. So what I was thinking about is this. If you look at the left-hand half and the right-hand half of the mother's genome, it should be present in a ratio of one to one, just like my left hand and right hand. And now imagine if mother pass on the right-hand side to the baby, and the baby releases it back in the mother's blood. So inside the mother's blood, there should be more right-hand half compared with left-hand half. So basically what you do is that you go in the mother's blood, and then you count the number of halves. And that is the side that the baby has got and then you do it several million times. OK, so that's a theory. OK, does it work? Now, to see if it works, we actually recruited a couple who are both carriers of this genetic anemia called beta thalassemia. And the mother is 12 weeks pregnant. So take some blood from her and do sequencing. Now, I'll show you how difficult this was at that time. If you do a Down syndrome test, you sequence 5 million molecules. You have a 99% accurate test. But for this one, we actually have a sequence, 4 billion molecules. When we did this, this one case cost us 200,000 US dollars. But in the end, it's worth it because it's the data. So this is called a circles plot, in which we plot the data in a circle. You can see a different chromosome. And the fetal signal is in blue, so you can see the whole fetal genome is there. And then the gene for beta thalassemia is on chromosome 11, so you can zoom in, and then we know the baby is a carrier of this beta thalassemia. So this work was then published uh, in this magazine. And about one year and a half later, two groups in the US confirmed data. One is from Jay Shenduri, and the other one is, of course, from our friend Steve Quick. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, you can imagine if we invent a technology like that, they're bound to have some ethical, social, and legal issues. Now, because the technology seems to be very simple, just take a blood sample of a mother, and be able to tell something about a baby. 
And of course, one of the things is that some companies might decide to directly market to the consumer and even to do it for non-medical reasons. Now, unfortunately, when you search on the internet, you find indeed that is the case. Now, for example, there's some company which actually use it for sex detection, for social reasons. Actually, this company is called Red or Blue. And they even quote a paper saying that this thing is scientific proven. And this is an Australian company which does the same thing for 299 Australian dollar. And strangely, they even claim that say that this is not based on astrology, <laughs> which is very, very odd. Now, but unfortunately in China, we also have that problem because there's still some, uh, some population who prefer boys more than girls. Even though in mainland China, we have actually strict laws to prevent actually doing sexing for social reason. But unfortunately in Hong Kong, we actually paradoxically don't have those laws. So now there are some people which they smuggle pregnant blood sample from mainland China to Hong Kong and do the test. So I think actually in Hong Kong, we probably need to have some regulations against that. But in addition to sexing, there's also some other companies do that for paternity testing because certain pregnant lady, maybe because of social or lifestyle reason, they may not be very clear who is the father of the baby. And so there's companies like that in which they call this toll-free number, are you my dad? <laughs> <laughs> and they, they say that you don't need to take any blood from alleged fathers. Okay, so surely this shows you that when scientific advances progresses, the social side also need to progress. And of course, when we talk about fetal genome, when we publish that, the London Times actually have a front page article talking about that and emphasize on the ethical and social issues. And the Scientific America actually thought that maybe there's too much information because how many pregnant women you know who will be able to digest what it means to have the whole fetal genome in her pocket? And then nature also warned against this flood of fetal gene screening. Now, so you can see how this field has developed, okay? So I read those two nature medicine papers and about cancer DNA in blood and led me to discover the fetal DNA in blood. Now the fetal side is going so well, then maybe we can feed back what we've learned back into cancer. So we need a model system. So a model system we work on is something called nasopharyngeal cancer. It's a head and neck cancer called NPC, which affect this part of anatomy. So you can see this cancer there. And one reason why I look at this cancer is because this cancer is very common in the southern part of China. Say a Cantonese man like myself, with a lifetime risk of this cancer, one in 39. I actually lost my best friend to this cancer in, when he was in his 30s. Another reason why we look at this cancer is because just like a Y chromosome is a very powerful marker for field DNA, for cancer, you ideally also have a marker which is associated with tumor cells. And for an NPC, we have that in the form of Epstein-Barr virus, or EBV. Because somehow, you can actually find this EBV virus DNA in all NPC tumor cells. So I was wondering, is it possible that an NPC tumor cell would release this virus DNA into the bloodstream? Now, I still remember when I first spoke with the clinician in our hospital about this, they actually laughed at me because Virtually 98% of us in this room are chronic EBV carriers. So they think if we do a test like this, it's going to have terrible specificity. But surprisingly, when we did the experiment, we find it's very good. So we did this in 99. You can see that the plasma of NPC patient is stuffed full of this EBV DNA. And people without the cancer, most of them are negative. So the question is, what are we detecting? Are we talking about those people have the whole virion, the virus molecules, flowing through in the blood, or are we talking about fragments of DNA? So what we did is that we developed a whole series of this PCR assay of different size, from 80 base pair all the way one, up to 1,000 base pair, and asked, are they long molecules or short molecules? And interestingly, we find that over 80% of those virus DNA molecules are shorter than 181 base pair. They're basically circulating bits of chromatin, we call nucleosomes. And also, we ask, okay, is this marker a real-time marker, just like the babies? Because I show you, when the baby is born, the DNA is gone. So how about in this case, is this a real-time marker? And the answer is yes. Now, for example, you treat the patient with radiotherapy. You find in the first few days, there's a surge of this DNA up, maybe because many tumor cells are killed. And after that, it's clear. We have half-life like four days. 
And we find that the shortest half-life, the more radiosensitive a tumor is. But let's say if you don't treat with radiotherapy, you treat with surgery, they can see that the patterns is different. Now, when the surgeon is trying to remove the tumor, there is a surge in this DNA, and after that, it's clear very quickly, 1.5 hours. So this is in the short term. How about longer term? Now, longer term is also very good. For example, like this individual, initial level is high, you treat radiotherapy, it drops, and then when cancer comes back, it rises again, you treat, it drops again. So now in the liquid biopsy literature, you see many of these graphs. But all of this was actually prophesized by this work which we did 20 years ago. On the other hand, if you have people who are doing well, you can see, for example, like this individual, they are, have a high level before treatment, but after you treat, they go to a low level and stay there. So those are people who is going to be cured of this disease. So all of this showed that this particular marker is an archetypal model for liquid biopsy. Now, if that's the case, we can actually use it to answer a question which has been poorly answered to date. And one of those is whether we can use this technology for early detection of cancer, which I mean, which also touch on. Now, we think it's worth doing because for this cancer, like many other cancers, the early detected, the better is prognosis. If you detect in stage one, the long-term prognosis is over 90%. You detect in stage four, it dropped to 60%. But even though Hong Kong has quite a good healthcare system, but unfortunately, some 76% of this cancer is detected in stage three and stage four. And we want to do something about that. We want to change this. So what we want to do is to actually propose a few years ago to do a large-scale study in which we'll screen 20,000 subjects in Hong Kong over a period of like three years. We'd like to focus on a high risk group, which is men between the age of 40 and 60. We'd like to see if we can use this technology to push early the detection. So this is a study protocol. So everybody in recruiting the study will have this test once. If it's positive, then we wait four weeks and we test it again. And the reason why we do that is because we reckon that at least two reasons why people will have this virus DNA in blood. One is that they have the cancer. And number two is if somehow the immune system is working less well at that juncture, then we think if we give them four weeks to recover, then maybe this will reduce the false positive rate. So if both of those tests are positive, then we'll go for endoscopy and MRI, and then we'll treat any cancer we see, and they will follow the whole group for 10 years. So every week we send a team to each of the 18 districts in Hong Kong, and every week we recruit about 200 patients. And actually this study was uh, finished, and then we find we recruited just over 20,000 subjects. And 5.5% of them are positive on the first test. And 1.5% of them are positive in both tests. And of this, we actually see 34 cases of cancer. So positive predictive value is 11%, which is actually quite powerful because imagine when Chen Ming Ding talked about the first colonoscopy, uh, uh, the, the first fecal occult blood test, the positive predictive value is 0.5%. Now, so this is what happened in Hong Kong now without screening. You can see that most of this cancer is discovered in stage three and stage four. But now, with screening, we change that completely. So now, most cases is in stage one and stage two. Actually, 70% is in early stage. And furthermore, when we follow those individuals up, we find that the prognosis is improved a lot. So this is the group identified with screening, or but one of those individuals survived. On the other hand, if you don't screen, actually the mortality rate is much higher. So the chance of dying is actually 10% if you use a screening. So we believe actually if we launch this technology, probably within a few years, the mortality from this cancer will be halved. So this work was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And we're very happy actually that NUGM has chosen this as one of their 10 notable papers of that year. So one question we might ask is, why is this test so good? And we think one of the reasons why it's so good is because every tumor cell has got multiple copies of this virus DNA. It actually has 50 copies. And the PCR target that we're using is repeated 10 times every EBV genome. So in other words, it's like you're detecting 500 tumor mark markers in one go. And we think that number 500 is important if you're trying to expand from this cancer to other cancer types. And also for the last few months, we also have a chance to ponder on why are we getting some false positive results. So we have some people with this virus DNA in blood, 
but somehow we do not have cancer. Now we think it's likely that those individuals have reactivation of this virus. So basically what we're asking is what are the factors which will predispose to virus reactivation? So as we heard from Zhang Han yesterday, we know as we grow older, our immune system works less well. So one of the things we look at is to look at age. You can see that basically the subject is uh, the age increase, the chance of having positive, positive result increases. And then another thing we wonder is, you now in Chinese medicine, we also have this thinking that if the weather is cold, our immune system is worse, okay? So just out of curiosity, I actually went to the Hong Kong Observatory and get the temperature of the day when we take a blood sample from a patient and plot it to the false positive rate. And surprisingly, there's a direct correlation. The colder temperature is, the higher the false positive rate. And of course, a lot of research can be done there. For example, we can use a repertoire sequencing method described by Jan into this. But on the other hand, irrespective of those biological reasons, on the practical side, if I want to do this screening, it will be more cost effective to do it in the summer than in winter. <laughs> but nasopharyngeal cancer is only the first step because as we, when we do the non-invasive prenatal testing, we have accumulated all this technology which we can interrogate other parts of the human genome in the plasma. So basically, the whole technology can be used to screen for virtually any cancer test, so develop, to any cancer type. So in other words, to develop a pan-cancer screening test. So we are very interested to push this of technology out in the clinic as soon as possible. But from our experience with non-invasive prenatal testing, we know that the best way to do this is to work with companies, or better still, to have your own company. So in collaboration with two of my colleagues, so Rosa Chu and Alan Chen, we just started a company called Serena, which stands for Circulating Nucleic Acid, so in which we actually try to develop uh, products which can detect cancer at the early stage to, and, and allow us to do something about it. But strangely, at the same time, in the Silicon Valley, there's another company called Grail, which does the same thing, right? To detect cancer early when it's being cured. So now it's the two companies basically moving in the same direction. So in 2017, the two companies start to talk with each other, and we decide that it's to our interest to merge together. So we merge actually in the middle of 2017. And so, so interesting, this is a party in which we actually celebrate this merger, and this is the founding CEO of Grail, Jeff Huber, who is a guy who actually led the team which developed Google Maps, okay? And this is actually in the first match of the NBA Finals in San Francisco. So very interesting. So we're now working very hard in, towards this pan-cancer screening concept. So in conclusion, hope I've convinced you that, that circling nuclear acid is a treasure trove for molecular diagnostics. With it, the era of non-invasive prenatal testing is already with us. And many of the concepts we use for fetal testing can be equally applied to cancer. And we believe this will allow us to do early cancer detection, which will save lives. And finally, I'd like to thank individuals from my groups uh, in Hong Kong, which have been working with me for the last 20 years to make this work possible. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dennis. Wonderful talk. Uh, questions, please. So I'm curious about the cellular source of all of this DNA circulating in the bloodstream and whether or not there's any information as to which cells it's coming from as to whether or not that makes a difference. And in the case of cancer, where you can actually do a CTC for circulating tumor cells, whether or not there's a correlation at the high end for the number of cells circulating and your DNA markers. Yes, so the second point, so in the literature now, there are some people who correlate CTC with cDNA. So basically, the concentration of cDNA is much higher. It's, it's maybe two or three order magnitude higher than CTC. Uh, and so I would say that most of the workers in the field probably work, like to work on cell-free rather than cells at this juncture. Now, we have also spent a lot of time to work, look at different types of the tissue origin of this circling DNA. So we have a technology called plasma DNA tissue mapping, in which we look at basically about 6,000 methylation markers from different tissue types to look into it. So interestingly, for example, we know that the liver is a very important contributor to the circulating DNA pool. It contributes between 5 to 10%. And there's also some unexpected players. Now, for example, one very unexpected player is that if you look at a human blood film, 
the most major type of cell is red cells, right? And red cell concentration is 1,000 times above white cells. But human red cells don't have nucleus, right? So we ask the question, where does the nucleus go? Is it possible that a bit of that nucleus could find its way into the plasma? If that's the case, there would be a lot of circling DNA which is of red cell origin. And interesting, there are indeed. So 25% of a circling DNA is from red cell. And we can actually use that as a new way to look at different types of anemia. For example, when you have aplastic anemia, that red cell constituent drop down. You have hemolytic anemia, it shoots sky high. So in the future, maybe you can use that to look at athletes who cheat by injecting them with EPO, for example. In your screening test for NPC, did you also look at collect saliva from those people, or can you tell us something about um, saliva testing? Uh, in this trial, we have not. But of course, I'm aware of the work done in Canada in which they have this nasal brush uh, in which they go in and, and brush it. Yeah. Hi. My question is, um, Epstein-Barr is an incredibly ubiquitous virus. What's your hypothesis about why this cancer is so prevalent in this special group of people? And what have you done to kind of look at that question? Uh, the current understanding is basically the combination of the virus, the combination of genetics. People have done GWAS in Chinese population. There's certain HLA types and other gene variants which predispose to NPC. And finally, it's our dietary habit has been correlated with salted fish consumption before the age of eight. And it seems that actually this Epstein virus associated cancer have different manifestations in different populations. Of course, like in the African, if you plus the malaria, then they have Burkitt's lymphoma. Dennis, yeah. great talk. Um, it, it, as this technology needs to reach all parts of the world of different economic status, uh, it'll face the same kinds of challenges that hepatitis C treatment has faced and so on. Have you got some comments about how the combined efforts are going to be able to deal with those different economic situations? Um, yeah, I think this is still early days, so we we'll still continue to think about that. Now, for example, in the New England Journal screening paper, we basically just use a PCR on two occasions. Okay? So that should be very cheap because in the... Uh, in that paper, we estimate it only costs 25 US dollars per test. Very, very cheap. But we now have a second or even third generation version of that in which we reflex the positive PCR test to a sequencing test. So that would be more expensive. But on the other hand, that will allow you to test it on one occasion instead of having to ask the patient to come back four weeks later. So I think at the end of the day, probably we will develop that as to different markets. Just like NIPT, for example, in mainland China now, the test is probably 150 uh, uh, US dollars. But whereas in, in, in other parts of the world, it could be 700. Okay, any other questions? One final question. I wonder if you could do something on a much bigger scale, which is uh, GWAS and FIWAS, that is genome-wide association study and phenome-wide association study, where you could take all your sequences and ask what phenotypes from the electronic records are associated with those, and then you could do the exact opposite, which is to um, start with genotype, with um, phenotype, and, and regress that onto um, all the pieces of DNA and see where variation in those is associated. Have you ever done that? That was actually a recent cell paper published by BGI. Uh, in cell, uh, because you can imagine that BGI now do a million of this NIPT every year, and that data is sitting in the bank. So in this cell paper, they look at about 140,000 pregnant women, and they show that you can do GWAS, and that you can even do some sort of viral association, so some sort of hidden viral infection they can get from that data set. So I think every year now, you talk about six million of this data, which I think is wasted unless we utilize it. But Dennis, does Stephen Quake ever do anything original, or is he just always following in your footsteps? No, no, actually, I have a lot of respect for Stephen Quake. I think he has, uh, you know, he's a serial entrepreneur. He developed the, um, the helicose system. He developed the fluid dime, et cetera. So 
I think in a way, having a competition speed up this development. Yeah. I'm kidding, of course. <laughs> uh, all right, let's break, and we will resume at 11 o'clock after coffee. <laughs>